Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's episode. Or I should say tonight's episode. A title occurred that uh, I could not let go. An idea arose to me where it was as if, uh, like, the whole world was, like, struck with lightning for a second. It was like an instant shock. And so, it's this title, The Source of Knowledge is Unknown, or The Unknown Source of Knowledge. I feel um, this is uh, something that's important to talk about. But also to fathom its implication. And so I've made some notes, but really, it's, um, this episode is me pretty much diving deep into uh, what is the observation of everything having an unknown source mean, like what do we do with it. I guess I'll begin. By explaining my approach and pretty much what I do when it comes to, <clears throat> you know, what people call thinking to me is, is like a, a sort of technique-oriented approach to reality. When I think about reality, ultimately, when I think about anything, and anything I want to remember even, it has to do with where is the context in the moment and where is the concept in the moment. Or I should say differently, what is the context to the moment and how are the concepts present in that context? Just like we find our sense of self in a world, the world is the context and in some sense the concept is the one who's uh, keeping the context alive, keeping it uh, uh, there. Pretty much this codependent relationship of the concept and context. So when I think about the source of knowledge is unknown, it's like human beings wondering pre-past and post-future. pretty much the starting point for our species. Is that the concept of reality, we are known. The context of reality is unknown. This whole time, you know, every human being that has lived on this planet, every human being their mind was a sort of film playing out while they were alive in this world. It's as if everything has been, from the beginning, taking place in the unknown. <clears throat> the mysteries of human intelligence all lead to the unknown. The edge of knowledge is the unknown.
Now, the moment a person identifies, let's say, an axis, a person can play around with possibilities. So I can wonder what would a universe or a world look like where the concept was known or the concept was unknown or a world where the context is known and the context is unknown. <coughs> and all the combinations of these. Now, somebody may say, Mr. Within, knowledge comes from the world. The world is known. How are you saying the source of knowledge is unknown? I would say that the causal position, that means if the human intelligence looked at reality and we divided it into cause and effect, <clears throat> it's as if the cause is unknown, that means what sparked, what ignited the Big Bang, what put the key to the key in the engine of the universe, or how God even created itself from a religious angle. You see, we reach a certain point where we are stepping out of time. So it's kind of like this where <clears throat> when I go to the past, I eventually reach my earliest memory and behind my earliest memory is that which is contentless. So it's like we, when you reverse engineer your sense of self, you know, let's say the child is in like a known world as a known self. That when the child realizes the world is like an unknown world, it has edges we can't see, it's too big to index. <clears throat> so then comes the observation of what if my sense of self, what if that which is in the world is unknown too, right? It's as if, like, if the world is being agreed that it has an unknown source, then why does that exclude anything in it? <clears throat> and people can say if knowledge is man made, It's as if language is a... Uh, what we call conception is just the attempt of creatures that appeared on a rock. Do you see what I'm saying? It's like a lot of things are unknown and only in limited and conditional states they become known. <clears throat> it's as if like a person sees um, Let's say a person sees a blurry picture, you know. There was this genius comedian by the name of Mitch Hedge, Hedgeberg. Mitch Hedberg. <clears throat> and he had this joke where he's like, what if uh, uh, Bigfoot is actually blurry? Like, how scary would it be if a blurry monster is running around? You know, it's not the cameraman's fault, right? <clears throat> so let's say we see some sort of blurry event and we cannot identify it. Really what knowledge is, is pattern recognition and reactivation. But what is the difference between somebody who wants to learn something and somebody who wants to discover something? <clears throat> you know, it's as if from one angle, it's a verification of your past and the present. From another angle, it's the recognition that the future is, it, is it like the future inside of a changing world is beyond pattern recognition, right? It's kind of like I'm seeing eight billion creatures on on this planet, <clears throat> and I wonder about okay, how from the moment that the human being logs into the conscious waking state, what is happening? And what is happening is there is this presence of a viewer of the moment, the awareness to the moment, and based on the known and unknown variables, the inner realm animates the day overlaid upon the actual outer realm. <clears throat> so I'm saying that um, the concept, that when we conceive life, we have said, all right, we're human beings on earth, we've named this, you know, we've named the periodic table. So it's as if the concept of life is being kept as known, but its context is unknown when you go further in the reach. If a person just wonders, here, I'll go to the second part. <clears throat> so pretty much what does it mean the source of knowledge is unknown? It, it means Jon Snow knows nothing. 
it means that all of language is on the thin eyes of an unknown experiential presence to reality. <clears throat> so it means that it cannot be known. Now, how would an unknown being know the unknown? That's an, I'll get to that. <clears throat> so what does it mean? It means um, the database of information we're using to explain to ourself in the moment what we are has limitations in an unknown world. That's what it means. Okay, now what does this imply? So here again, um, I have different axi. <clears throat> so what, what does it imply impersonally, personally? Personally, it's a bit intense, okay? So it's like, it's like if your whole life you have been treating something the same way it's recognizing like its value the value system you previously had is different or is incomplete <clears throat> so the person in some sense uh gives themselves the privilege of a new value system when i say impersonal personal it's because you know contrary to modern belief that we're just one person we're actually living two lives at the same time if you if you see at the bottom i've i've put real on real outer inner <clears throat> so that's the implication that there is an inner life and an outer life for our outer life we are a shape uh, a shaped entity, a shaped intelligence, and what we consider knowledge is the linking of shapes in our intelligence. You know, <clears throat> it's like a it's like a child sitting in a classroom. The teacher is talking, right, and the teacher is explaining something, and this student just looks at the teacher, and it's like, what is this guy teaching? Symbolism symbolism that's trying to touch the truth of reality you see it's as if knowledge is a video game <clears throat> and based on how its earlier code is it's like the video game has a sort of existence the biggest clue uh, would be duality for me when i look at human thought everything is dualistic right it's the sense of a person to be a person, to be <clears throat> an individual, that, that is a duality on its own by the nature of a self separate from the whole world event, right? <clears throat> so it's as if for a separate being there is the known and the unknown. For a being that has, in, in some sense, does not have a separate experience of life or a non dual experience of life, then there is no language necessary. You see, it's as if, like, in some situations, we add dimensions to, <clears throat> uh, you know, understand something. In another view, there's no need to add dimensions. It's as if either, the in, it's like either the sense of self adjusts to the truth of the world or the world is adjusting to the truth of the self. Now, when the world adjusts to the truth of the self, that is the domain of personality, language, and meaning, right? Our sense of self is a reaction to the existential environment. So what it is is that people don't show it, but if people truly became conscious on a cosmic scale, not a planetary, not a cultural, national scale, like that's limited. You know, the world is so big and we're, we're choosing to identify, <clears throat> you know, which concentric circle of a context we would like to have for the world, right? You can live on this, you can exist in this world as an individual human being, or you can exist to yourself as an unknown presence where in every moment there's an experiential revelation of how it's happening. <clears throat> there's a man I recently heard is this quote from him, his name is Sadhguru. And Sadhguru was on the Joe Rogan podcast. And he told Joe Rogan there's a user manual into, into like how to be an enlightened human being or something. <clears throat> and Joe Rogan says, where's the user manual? And Sadhguru says the user manual is built into the system. It's another way of saying that if the body heals itself, when, when let's say the skin is torn, you know, the white blood cells appear to heal. So similarly, we can say that when the psyche is torn, there's a sort of energy, right? It's as if there is a self-guiding system built in. The backup system to existence is within the nature of existence. 
that means we think you have to, a person has to go accumulate information. The whole world is information. Everything is in a sort of shape and form. For me, it's like um, when we, you know, in, in this anime <coughs> called uh, Dragon Ball Z or something, right? So in this anime, they, there was this idea of like the main character being part of a warrior species. I would say when it comes to human intelligence, we are a designer species. Everything has shape. Everything is being contained in sophisticated levels. And to fit into culture is to accept the levels that it has been, to, is to accept the classification of values of experience, <clears throat> right? So impersonally, it doesn't really imply much because it's like, it's like saying that the unknown is the unknown. That is a sort of psychological freedom in itself. <clears throat> but for the person, it can be very intense to suddenly realize, you know, the, the totality of the story of the meaning of the world is on thin ice. And this thin ice cracks when the unknown presence of the being is acknowledged. You see, the issue is not that man cannot accept truth. The issue, do you know, is man cannot accept himself before he can accept truth. You see, that is the biggest challenge. <clears throat> when you think about life and the levels that can happen here, I'll add another, I'll add another sentence here. We can put it this way, the unconscious and the conscious. In our conscious life, knowledge is like the bread and butter, you know. <laughs> about like what is the best case scenario for human beings it's as if we want conscious efficient expression of the human lifetime <clears throat> you know imagine like you know you, you were the manager of a company but this company was like you know a species right and the manager is looking at the company and it's like how do we improve the performance of like the members of civilization Okay. Now imagine the manager realizes that aside from assigning a role to every individual in the, in, 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 in the sectors of civilization, <clears throat> more importantly, it is to provide access to the greatest value system. If you look at really what society is, it's a hierarchy. It doesn't matter if it's matriarchal or patriarchal. Either way, there will be hierarchy. And when I say hierarchy, I'm not talking about like, you know, the Karl Marxian fashion. I'm talking about that every human being, like there is this force within human beings that they want to experience their greater self. It's just there, you know. <clears throat> and competition in some sense fuels this, you know. But now imagine we have, let's say, this view of a capitalistic society. And let's say, and it, it, right now, civilization is going through a layer of decency, a phase of indecency. So let's just assume a decent capitalistic society, okay? If that's even possible to fathom. So it would be as if individuals have a personal identity and based on the energy uh, they have and the effort, you know, they exert, the story of their life and culture animates. You know what it is? It's like society is a simulation space. That means sometimes I, I think, okay, let's say there were extraterrestrials from beyond the clouds, like just observing. <clears throat> the human species like being like okay what are these human beings doing really what it is is it's like these physiological entities that in every moment have somehow cultivated a very fast psychological simulation 
uh, ability. So what it means is that every moment the person, let's say you're driving and you turn on a street, it's as if all the content in that street becomes another sort of level of reality the person needs to respond to. What I'm trying to say is really what the Japanese have said in, in simpler words where they say the man is the room he's in. <clears throat> so that means your free will is reacting or responding, either unconsciously reacting or consciously responding to the stimulus of the environment, to the content of the environment. Now imagine realizing the, the roots of the content of the environment are unknown. What this would imply is that for the first time, the human psychology in civilization will feel like it is nowhere. <clears throat> People may think this is a bad thing, but really, when you reset a system, you are taking it's you are it's like you're reverse engineering through its previous value system, reaching a null nullification point, which is like a zero point, and then from that zero point reemerges, you know, the principles of let's say a different context to reality. I think this, the title of this episode is honestly the, one of the most important thing that the, the important topics that future philosophers can engage with. <clears throat> you know, imagine this great philosophical search begins for the unknown source of knowledge. And at the limitations of our knowledge, we discover that it is only experientially accessible. That means if I wanted to, as a subject, uh, try to access the whole moment, it's impossible. If I try just as a body to access the whole moment, it's impossible. It is only when the body and mind, are, there is no effort in those dimensions and there's just being. You see, this is the cool thing. There's this, we think of ourselves as human being, but we think the human being are just one level of a concept. It is two levels. There's the human dimension, which is the shape-oriented realness, right? And then there's the being part, which how the mind is being the space for life, for the, the free will is in a space, right? That means when a person makes a decision, what's going on? It's, it's as if like, it, even though it is in the outer realms, a sort of, you know, so let me say it, what I say in other talks, that in front of your, our eyes, it's like one existential physical server, objective server. Behind our eyes, you know, uh, is, is like a private subjective server. Okay. What this means is that even though our bodies are existing in one physical world, our minds are living in 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 in, in the <clears throat> our minds are living in accordance to how much the body has access. Okay? So what I'm trying to say is that the sense of self of the human being seems to be a reaction to the changes of the moment, but when the person realizes what the moment is, is a presence, is a quality of just how this universe is existing. I'm just trying to say that meaning is happening in a different dimension <clears throat> than how existence is happening. Existence has a silent component to it. If I treat myself just as an existential being, there is no fear of death. There is no, you know, absence of life. <clears throat> you know, or I, I should say there is no life. It's as if uh, 
I'm, you know, if I had a purely existential view, I'd be like, okay, existence is existing, end of all conception and the journey of knowledge. <clears throat> but because I, there is an experiential dimension, the experiential dimension to the human being is how a person behind their eyes can experience a creator archetype. It's like in front of our eyes, we are, sometimes I think this, this was the case, but of course I don't want to make too bold of a statement, but sometimes when I look at religion, <clears throat> and uh, to me, the, the religion, the, uh, the, the Abrahamic um, uh, structure, uh, the structure to Abrahamic religion, for me, it's kind of like a metaphor for the, the, for the dimensions of a person. It's as if in front of your eyes, you are the creation, not the creator. Behind your eyes, you're the creator, not the creation. And it's as if what happens behind your eyes dictates the will of what is in front of your eyes. Isn't that remarkable? <clears throat> Our journey in life so far and the participation of all our past senses of self in the present. I feel the epitome of knowledge is a return to the unknown, really. And the unknown, the next, like how you experience, how you explore the unknown is just experiential, guys. This is something no teacher could tell. Let me tell you why. <clears throat> because if a teacher told the student that truth is experiential, the student would not need the teacher. This is why I entertain this view that there is no such thing as student and teachers, no guru, disciple, all of that. It's like how the past animated their cultures. And really what it is, it's like a species fascinated by the wonder of the landscape it finds itself in. You see, these are, it's as if we look at an event as a singular causal event, and then we contemplate it through chaos and order, which means the event became an, an existential event, became a dualistic experiential event. And then from the edge of the dualistic experiential event, we realize that there is three ways. There are, so in something here, I got to show it. There we go. I wrote three questions which I was going to attempt to answer. So the last question, if the source of knowledge is unknown, then what happens to the purpose of knowledge? <clears throat> so this is the important thing, that I feel there are three avenues it can go. So human knowledge, which is shaped, dynamic identification with a, with a world event, you know, both inner world and outer world event. So it's as if the purpose of our of human knowledge could be is that we treat it like art. Okay, that could be something that we realize everything is really the brain being an artist when it comes to how it draws in and out reality. <clears throat> so the purpose of knowledge here, I'll, I'll say it from, from this context, it can go to the void think of this that it can go to zero so people are going to be like knowledge doesn't mean anything this is one way you can interpret the unknown source to knowledge <clears throat> another view would be is that we realize all knowledge is connected and interconnected and there are no branches of knowledge knowledge was an ocean and uh, the knower was like a wave in this ocean Okay, so it's either we take the purpose of knowledge becomes to realize it, it was all singular from the beginning. <clears throat> the other view is we maintain the purpose of knowledge as just the, techno the linguistic technology we're using to filter chaotic and ordered uh, happenings of the world, right? So, it's, so, so the destination could be kept dualistic, which civilization 1.0, our current civilization, this is what's happening. You know, it's like our minds are living in a duality, our bodies are living in a singularity, and the world which the, which its edge we cannot see is like a void, unknown. 
But anyways, so one attitude, one, one direction for the purpose of knowledge is zero volt. One direction to the purpose of knowledge is singular. One direction is dualistic in regards to the maintenance of chaos and order till the end of time. Another view is that it becomes infinite. And you see, infinity is so remarkable as a concept because it makes the destiny. It's, infinity is another way of saying the effect of something can, can never be seen. Right? It's as if like, like an endless energetic event that's infinitely happening. Do you see what I'm saying? It's like you can't see its edge. Infinity is, is another way of saying uh, <clears throat> your fingers can't touch truth, but they've gotten the closest they can. Do you know? Or we realize that now I go to this, I'll go to the second question. What if the truth of change is a circle? What if in actuality, it's literally like even though you can have the view of God, universal intelligence, but what if it is on some level mechanical in a circular way? So for me, it's as if like, okay, space is constant, space is space. And then there is singular individuals arise and then individuals lead, uh, two individuals create more individuals. So, it is, so it's as if the individual and the world is a dualistic experience. So it's pretty much like there was nothing then there came a singular object. Then this object somehow had the capacity to go through evolution and become a subject to itself. So the mind uh, started standing in the world, in, in human history. <clears throat> and beyond duality, infinity would mean maxing out all dimensions of perception. To be an infinite being means all any quality attributed is maxed out. You know, so let's say if an infinite being is sadness, its sadness is infinite. If an infinite being is happy, its happiness is infinite. So this circular relationship is pretty much things arise from the void. They become, they go through a singular phase, a dualistic phase, an infinite phase, and beyond infinity, it's as if you either stay in infinity or there's a return to the void. It's pretty much like either you, you, you stand as an immortal physical entity to the end of time or you actually reach the end of time. There's a blessing of nature that our mortality provides that. You know, that means anybody who wants to know at some point in this life, like nature will reveal to us you know, the secrets of time, or the secret of time. You know, there's been this thing I've heard from these people who've had near-death experiences, and they say that um, when they were in that near-death experience, it was as if their whole past, their whole life, like a film, was like scrolling in front of their eyes. And it's another way of saying, like, the brain is performing it it's it's like the brain is giving its last performance if we personally i'll go here if we personally identify with knowledge It's pretty much like when you go to find the source of your mind, you get to see how the free will is happening. And the greatest vision of that is instantaneous. So it's as if on an instantaneous level, existence, know, existence knows all of existence. But an experiential level, it is limited in accordance to this, how the storytelling engine of the brain has, has, has you know, worked so far. For me, I am realizing that uh, it's kind of like some sort of transcendental being went through a giant evolutionary slumber and was built with this urge to see beyond itself you see that's that's what i think the meaning of life is to go beyond it 
that means going beyond a relationship of looking at life and it just having meaning and when you think about what else could there be instead of meaning right it's as if meaning is necessary when one feels truth is not in the room but if truth was in the room if eight billion creatures on a planet inside a universe started to experience themselves as the whole universe what shift in the behavior of culture and civilization would we see that we actually saw universal beings or we remembered ourselves as such you know it's like they asked the person what were you in your past life you know were you a king in your past life and the person's like buddy i was the space where the world was happening in. you know it's like uh, you think you know prior to time there's a person who you know, creaturehood is just like, because we're creatures, we, are, we have a relationship with time that is personalized. But beyond having a relationship with time, ultimately, think of it this way. Let's say there was a very advanced human being. This advanced human being had read every book on the planet and remembered it. This human being had access to all the information in cyberspace. This human being had all the greatest teachers of the world come and teach it and successfully share their lesson, right? And this person had seen everywhere as far as you can in the universe. Imagine, let's say, a finite universe where you could see its edge. It's like after you have known everything, it's like we're left to try to know nothing. And the remarkable thing is that where our, the persona is happening is technically to the un, inner witness, the inner unknown witness. It's nothing. That means the mind may seem like it's being projected from the body, but the mind to the reality of the body is nothing. But the, the body to the reality of the mind is also nothing. Right, so it's as if a person <clears throat> looks. It's like let's say you open your eyes in a world, and you're checking like the basic uh, positions of your intelligence. Right, so the person's like, okay, where is my physical body? They locate their own physical body in the moment. Right, they 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 feel the earth underneath their feet, the planet underneath their feet. They honor the vastness of the sky. Then the person, right after an existential kind of checkpoint of, of a confirmation of reality, the person goes to an experiential, right? Because what is going on is that the mind is living a life beyond the body. And because the mind is not an object, till the end of time in the linguistic simulation, there will be glitches and trying to attribute personality to meaningless existential movement. What it implies for culture is a new era of exploration. You know, it's as if, like, when you look at all the other species, animal species, lesser animal species, it's like they do have minds, <clears throat> but their minds are limited to the programming of their environment. But when you look at great people in history, like, for example, Martin Luther King, Tesla, like, I don't know, various other people, right? You see Marcus Aurelius, you see these great people being great because they had an ability to be in an environment and have the environment give them the instruction of behavior but their intelligence could see other environments while at being in an environment you see <clears throat> it's as if uh, if you're living in one world that's so old school if you're living in many worlds you're you know if in two worlds you're alive now in 2022, if you're living in many worlds, you are an intelligence that is associating with many senses of self simultaneously, right? What it means is, aside from the view that there's a good person and a bad person, there is endless variations in between. You see, once we expand the spectrum of reality, our beliefs on ourselves change. So, 
I had written limitless, actual limitations, limitless potential. That's really it, right? The unknown is a permission for a species to wonder about it, its presence of the experience of reality again. You see, that's what's not permitted because we want to fit into the story of the world. We can't fathom other ones. It's honestly like a Hunger Games of ideological systems. That's what that's what you know. What I when I wonder about the mind of our the, the mental state of our species. That's what's going on. People are idea worshiping, and then the ideas possess their free will, and then their free will thinks it was the idea from the beginning. That's the power of the unknown. It's like there's a purity to it. That in in regards to temporary knowledge, that purity is not there, and so when a species no longer fears itself, death and life do not become uh, an enclosement of the fullness of life. You see, there are things that have nothing to do with. Um, or let me say it this way: a person in, in their lifetime may experience a moment that has nothing to do with how their subjective inner realms is happening or how the objective inner realms is happening. It's as if like an unknown being being unknown in a, uh, you know, in a world that was unknown from the beginning. It's like that a sense of being unknown is a multidimensional homely feeling for, for, the, for at least the mystic. You see, this is why I have an incredible honor for the term mystic because mystics were simply defined as lovers of the unknown in a world where everybody fears the unknown the mystics realized that the moment they loved it it was as if the fear of what will happen goes away you see it's as if that when you care for something it becomes important when it's important your ability becomes instant it's like you know you could have a person you know in the educational system being treated as if like that person's you know behind the butt <laughs> but that person in an emergency can incredibly act right so what this means what this really means is that intelligent activity and intellectual analysis of the realm are two separate things see I'm, I'm pretty much saying that um, existence is being existence uh, free will is um, using ex you know through an experiential mode you know storifying reality and beyond the stories of the world we are the space where it's all happening people think meditation is about not having thoughts meditation is pretty much you can say another way of a being identifying with the effect position of reality returning to a causal position right if the effect of let's say there was we have this view of cause and effect <clears throat> and we have this view that there's an unknown cause and a known effect and we all are being the known effect of what happened prior to the big bang prior to the birth of time space <sighs> the responsibility of the future generations and the and how truly advanced they would be is in really what kind of world they're acknowledging the fearless will acknowledge the unknown easily and they will realize that it means the unknown is another way of saying everything has a potential we don't know about that means you right now listening to me just fathom how many different ways can you just have an attitude to yourself in the moment so many different ways and the unknown gives that freedom the species needs to uh, remember the value of the unknown was experiential living prior to the value of the known, which is conceptual living. 
a species that monitors and at the same time efficiently and smoothly pilots between its inner realm and outer realm it means the inner life is doesn't have expectations for the outer life at first when the stimulus wave hits but it's like it's pretty much like your outer life is at peace with existing and your inner life is at peace with just being experienced and once these two your inner life and outer life at peace there comes this overall peace which is the how the whole moment is being the moment regardless what you do you see that's the fascinating thing about the world uh, we appear as a uh, as, as a you know a person on the shoulder of a giant beyond our mind's containment it's like the universe is alive but it's alive in an unknown way and our lives are based on limited knowledge and databases of information you know it's like here's a better way i can say it imagine skydiving was the purpose of life so that would mean a species everybody would be just like going skydiving okay Now imagine there are young children and in this civilization that has said skydiving is the most important thing, in its educational system, they are trying to teach the students, okay, this is what skydiving means, this is what it implies. <laughs> you know, this is this is the this is uh, you know how you should stand on the plane, this is what the experience and eventually you see that language cannot give you the a, di a, di a direct experience of reality. Language is an echo of a direct experience. So you see, all of knowledge is kept in language. You know, it's like, you know, just like the Matrix, that dude who looked at the screen and saw code, that code was another way of saying if for, for human life, that code would be the, the inner realms of every individual, their subjective uh, meaning of reality. I guess the greatest thing I can say, what if the source of knowledge is unknown? Or uh, let me say it this way, what if before we were an object, just an object, or before we are just a subject, we are unknown space, intelligentsia, you know, intelligent space. I feel this is the, one of the greatest summits of human perception. Man has to choose. Shall he be empty of the world? You know, devoid of the world? Shall the person be the whole world? Shall the person be in the chaos and order of the world? Shall the person be infinity itself? Or shall the person realize that the greatest wisdom in an unknown changing world is perhaps to acknowledge change as the clue for the living in the universe, right? It's as if from it, when you look at a human being, when it moves, we're like, yo, that human being is animate. There's consciousness in there. But when we look at the world, the world, the cosmos, its body is everything. So when everything is changing, this is another way of saying like, change is 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 uh is 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 like the universe moving right this unknown presence of intelligence moving and to abide by change is in some sense to no longer uh, be on the shoulder of a giant but to in some sense uh walk alongside a giant as a giant you see that's the uh, power of the, the experiential activation of the human being Right, there's the story I'm going to share, <clears throat> and then um, I guess I can end it. I, I want to say that there can be Q and A at the end, but um, you know, I don't think there's going to be questions. What I'm saying is pretty clear, actually. 
I'm going to share with you the story of this um, guru with a bunch of disciples in the forest, like a bunch of yogis in India. And the guru looks at one of the students, you know, and they have been in the forest for years as like guru disciple thing, yogic thing. And so the guru, where the disciples trust, the guru looks at one of the disciples and gives him this bucket and he says, go get water from the river. And the disciples like, where's the river? And the gurus like, listen to the environment. It will tell you, listen to the, listen to nature. So this disciple grabs this bucket, goes, and he eventually he's like, what does that mean? But then he starts hearing the sound of the river and he just walks to the river and he finds the river. He gets to the edge of the river and he puts the bucket in the water and for a second he's just like staring at the water. He looks to his left and he's shocked. He is seeing the most beautiful, you know, divine presence of a girl he can see. This very beautiful woman is there. And so this disciple just drops the bucket and back in the day, this story from back in the day in yogic times, you know, in Vedic times, let's say. And so the guy goes to this woman, this was like the way they did it back in the day, and he says, you have to marry me, you know, not in an aggressive way, but the person says, like, I'm in love with you, you have to marry me, I want to marry you, right? And because, fe uh, you know, feminism was underdeveloped at that time, you know, you can imagine like a lot of daughters and women kind of being, uh, you know, they would stay at home like indoors than outdoors so anyways this beautiful woman looks at this disciple you know who has you know let go of the bucket and he says okay if you want to marry me you got to talk to my father and the girl is smart she says you're going to go talk to my father and I'm going to be listening from outside the room you know to what you say and this guy is so, you know, struck by luck, uh, by love that he's like, okay, let's go see your father, right? And so they go to the father's place in the story. And so the father's sitting in a room in front of him, you know, the disciples in front of the father and the girls, the, you know, listening from outside the room. And the father says, who the hell are you? <laughs> you know? And the man says, you know, I, I saw your daughter, I would like to marry her, you know. And the father says, tell me about yourself, you know, he says, you know, I, you know, I have a background in experiential psychology. <laughs> He's a yogi in a forest, like keep that point in mind. Anyways, the father says, okay, you seem like a decent person, decent natured person. There's one condition if you want to marry my daughter. I have never had a son. So from, from the moment you choose to marry my daughter, you cannot leave this village and this town. And the father says that when I become your father-in-law, like the father-in-law says that I am, he's the greatest landowner of the village. So after he dies, all of his lands would go to him and he can never go back. <clears throat> you know, and it's in that moment, he's like, oh my God, the disciples are thirsty. The guru is thirsty, right? But it's like, he's so in love with this girl that he says, you know, if he forgets it. And he says okay and he gets married and there's a ceremony and he's welcomed into the family right and so the father-in-law experiences like having a son-in-law you know like and you know the, the wife has children you know a daughter and a younger son you know and so the father-in-law passes away in this story and there's a moment where this man, this yogi, has become like the, you know, the, the, the Khan, the owner of like, has become the landowner, of the biggest landowner of the village. And he's, he's on this mountain hill. Excuse me. He's on this mountain hill. You know, and he, you know, his children are there on the hill and he's just, you know, you know, holding his wife and he's just looking at the sunset and he's like, wow, what a beautiful paradise of a life, right? And then suddenly he notices at the edge of town 
and he just zooms in and he notices it's like some sort of tsunami or something, right? And it's like waves of water are destroying all the land and everything in the village. And it's sur the water so much that it's surrounding the hill. And then he suddenly looks to his right, he sees his son slip, the daughter goes to save the son, the mother goes to save the children, and somehow they all slip and the waves take, take them away. And this guy, he's standing on the hill as if he has lost everything. You know, suddenly he has lost everything. And then he hears this voice, take the bucket out of the water. And he suddenly snaps out of it and realizes like his hand, he's still holding the bucket by the river and all of it was some sort of daydream, right? Now, now the point of this, the reason I'm sharing this is because it's suggesting that in that moment where the guys just put the bucket in the water and waiting for it to fill up, he visualized his inner realms created a wife, his inner realms created a father and mom. His inner ones created a family and being a village and all of this, right? But it was all in one instant, right? And this is a suggestion that in our inner realms, life is being experienced at such an incredibly fast and instantaneous speed, right? That in the outer realms, it doesn't matter. It's as if in the outer realms, existence is going at, I don't know, let's say a certain uh, speed, right? But when you look at the mind, the mind's ability to suddenly remember the past, suddenly jump into a future abstraction, right? The mind has this, the mind is like a teleporter and a time traveler at the same time, or just like that thing in the movie Jumper, right? Now, imagine that guy who put the bucket in the water, when he was on that hill in the daydream, he was convinced that that was his knowledge. He was convinced that that was his reality. But he woke up, you know, from that reality. So pretty much it's kind of like saying <clears throat> that the mind is constantly waking up from dreams and the body is like, you know, an art gallery where the artwork is just there for display. If the source of knowledge is unknown, if there's an unknown source to knowledge, it's as if like the armies of knowledge have to in some sense reassemble. We have to prepare for a multidimensional future as beings who are language shackled at the moment. There's so many unknown variables when it comes to the evolution of a civilization. <clears throat> you know, there's so many things that can happen. So, it, so the world, the future exists as a probability and once we act upon it, it becomes a reality. So anyways, I think it's like I've pretty much shared everything I can. I guess one thing I'll say that when it comes to collective identity, individual identity, <clears throat> you see culture is literally like everybody is being their own type of player and trying to play a collective game. So many people have this sense of what is normal, not realizing what can be normal in a changing world. It's like all the, it's like the moment something's normal, the moment we march into time and it's changed. Change is the only normal thing. And to identify with change means if the speed of that change was fast, it would mean that you can't identify with shape. <clears throat> that means life is happening faster than shape. Right. So to be that, it, in some sense, there's no longer a story. The species should find the freedom to not only explore an unknown world, but to wonder about the mysteries of the unknown self. Will Durant has this incredible quote. He says, knowledge can be the eye of desire and can become the pilot of the soul. 
and it's as if the soul is piloting beyond where the knowledge points to. <coughs> It's like to truly live or bring about an advanced civilization, we need a species responsible for its multidimensional perception rather than, <clears throat> you know, bunkering down in the safety of a singular storyline. Like, what is that? You know, it's as if it, it sh it should we care about Plato's noble lie? Should we lie to the species because it wants to feel better? Or should, should we, in some sense, you know, command the clouds that, in, or, uh, you know, command that which ecl eclipses truth to move away? Here, I'll write something down before I end off. You know, one thing we know is that there is intelligence present. And so really what knowledge is, is to discover the how intelligence is being present. And the reason we want to know how something works is because then that understanding shifts our own use of it, right? <clears throat> Human beings are like creatures where the moment we discovered something, we used it a lot. Think of fire, for example. An advanced civilization marches forth as an unknown sky smiles. Direct experience is the ultimate teacher when it comes to wondering about the source of knowledge and truly realizing why one person on this planet is saying the unknown is unknown and that is the epitome. <coughs> Anyways. I hope this episode was interesting and uh, comment below, you know, what, uh, how the 